Hi, my name is Anne Mwangi, the director of Mavid Dairy Farm. This is where the idea of the farm originated from. Walk with me. Method Dairy Farm did not start with cows at the very beginning. Our business in agribusiness started when we uh, we had the piece of a piece of blood uh, in this area, and we decided to grow vegetables. And that time we did vegetables which were indigenous. That's the terere, managu, kode, but not skumawiko or spinach. We used to sell quite a number of vegetables in the in Ushumi supermarket, uh, among many others, uh, small supermarkets. But come 2007, 2008, at the end of 2007, we all remember what was there after the election, and then there was the post election violence. And we came back to the farm in a small house, which is a two, two bedroomed semi, semi permanent house. We came into this farm and we, we had our children with us. But one morning we woke up and we noticed we cannot take tea with milk because we could not get milk anywhere. So, and our struggle was where do we get milk? So we could only go maybe to one Skaratina to get milk. That's about 40 kilometers away from where we are located. And because we needed the milk, we had to travel to Karatina, get the milk, and come back. Then, on the, at the, during the same time is when we figured out, what if we had a cow? Truth, truth be said, we had one cow, but which was the Zebu, the one with the ham. And uh, that one we had kept because of our staff who was on the farm, so that he can be getting a little a bit of milk to be taking during the morning and in the evening. So he used to milk maybe one liter in the morning, half a liter in the evening. But it couldn't be enough for all of us now that we are all here. And we had to stay on the farm for about two weeks as the situation in the country settled down. So when we, we sat down with my husband and uh, a friend who had come to visit us, we agreed maybe we are sitting on a gold mine without knowing. And we said, what about putting some animals in? So we came up with this idea of putting up some cows, but we were so much discouraged by anybody whom we discussed with about the cows. Because they were saying they can't survive in this area, the drought is too high, there is sassafras, there is mosquito, they will die of many diseases because of the, the climate conditions in the area. But we never gave it up. So what we decided, we'll go it the community way the way they are trying to see, but we'll see how much you can advance with their way of looking at things. So the first thing we did is we brought in a cow, the zebu, and we gave it a hybrid breed. So we had the first mixed breed, which we called 001. 001, it means it was a mixture of the uh, hybrid and zebu. We stayed with 001 and then we bred it and we got a 002, but now 002 was a, a better breed than the first one. So after that, uh, around mid of 208, we agreed with my husband what you do is why don't we now just bring in a few animals which are, you know, fully hybrid. We brought the first six. And in, the, in that herd of 208, which went on to come into two early, 209, 2009, we now continued and we have never looked back. We have just gone increasing in the numbers. From the six cows, of course they will give six cows. So you have 12. That was no big threat to us. We are able to feed them, we are able to get a market for their milk. Because the local community were able to absorb all the milk we had. Now, and then we started adding animals from other farmers. When we noticed that we needed more milk, because we are, the milk we were getting was not enough even to serve the community surrounding us, we decided to buy animals from other people. But this continued only for some time. And our biggest challenge now came up as we tried to scale out. Now we got now another challenge of the marketing for the milk. And it was when the milk reached to 150 per day. We noticed we cannot be able to sell the milk within with, uh, the community and we, didn't, we needed to look for a market for the 150. So one day, we were caught and we were told milk has 
not finished. How much is in the tank? About a, that time we had reached about 250. So they have managed to sell about 100, 150 is in the tank. We had a cooler, we had bought a cooler previously, which was 500 liters. So the 500 liters, you have 150 balance today. So you are sure of tomorrow you'll have another 150 balance. So we called uh, the various big processors to ask them whether we can deliver milk to them. And the first question we asked was, are you members of the association? Even KCC, we said we are not. So they said now that will give you a problem because we only buy milk for people who have got numbers or are members of this particular processor. We tried about three processors, we had the same answer. So on the third day, the tank was full. We literally drove to about two of the processors, I won't say their names, and asked them, we have 100, 400, 500 liters of milk in the tank, can we deliver it to you? They said, since you don't have a number with us, we cannot take the milk. So as we drove back to the farm, we had to think of what to do with this milk. Unfortunately, by the time we reached the farm, the milk had gotten spoiled. It was so painful, and uh, we started now thinking, what else can we do? If we are, these animals are going to continue increasing, they are giving birth. So the calves are becoming more, they are soon going to become fully uh, grown animals, they are going to be milked. Where will you be taking this milk? That's the time we decided to go to the next level of doing value addition. What about making yogurt? And uh, from that time, we started making yogurt. We started processing yogurt, which up to today, we still do a bit of yogurt and a bit of uh, fermented milk, what many people refer to as mala. I think the main, main thing, our uh, main breakthrough in, the, uh, in the, the progression of the farm came when we, uh, in 2016, the government said those people who are selling milk can only sell milk which is processed. We were among the people who were selling milk. And we had ATMs, six of them by that time. So we knew we are already caught. So we have to make arrangements of where will we be processing our milk because we still need to sell our milk. Much as we are taking milk to KCC, we still had some which we are selling to our milk bars through the ATMs. So the first thing we thought is why don't we get our own processing line? So we ordered for a processing line in 2016 for 500 liters per hour. It was meant for us. However, the same year, the government uh, ordered a circular saying that in January 2017, they will not license anybody who is selling milk that is not processed. Many of the people who are selling raw milk didn't know where to go and process their milk in the Mount Kenya region. So the daily board contacted us and asked us, is it true we hear you have put up a, a processing line? We said, yes, we have for our milk. They said, can you be able to accommodate other people? So they said, what we'll do is that we'll be anybody who wants milk to be processed from that direction, we'll be referring them to you. Please see what you can do for them, because otherwise they will also lose their business because we, are, we won't allow them to sell milk which is not processed. The people who are taking milk to Nairobi Row started now bringing the milk for personalization through our, our plant, but at a price. We, we charge four shillings and 50 cents only per litre. Now, what happened is that the 500 litre processing line became too small for this business. So by around April, we knew it can go far. So we had to import another bigger line, which is at 3,000 liters per hour, which was installed in September of the same year. And uh, now from September, we have been using the bigger line of uh, 3,000 liters per hour. So we have continued with now two businesses. We have our own milk to process, and then we have the, farmer, the, the other customers who come, and uh, the other model of customers who come, we pasteurize their milk, and then when they leave, now we pasteurize ours. In addition to what we do as a farm, the other things we do, and we have always done from the word go, when the farm was started, we wanted to set a farm which can be used as a demo farm for farmers. So as early as uh, 2016, we had started training farmers. People who are interested in knowing how they can uh, come up with a, a daily cow which can be able to produce milk which will show some, you know, is a business. So we started classes for farmers. And this has benefited not only Kenyans, we have gotten 
uh, groups from Uganda, we have got uh, groups from Ethiopia. I think Ethiopia we have had three groups. Uganda we had one group. In Kenya we have had groups from all over the country, including I think one of our very first groups was from Mumias. They were sent by the Mumias Sugar Factory, uh, among many others who have come. And we even have a classroom which was completely set for that purpose. Currently we are not using it because for the last one and a half years we have decided to close the farm on training until further notice for some lessons. What we decided after that is that we can uh, accept people who want to do a little bit of learning on daily farm, farming, but they can come as maybe four people. Then we walk through them, we walk through the farm with them. We explain what we do without getting into a classroom situation. And that way we have seen people, even within the community that around us, going into daily farming. Even those who had earlier when we started discouraged us have put up a cow. And to our pride is what makes us very feel proud of what we are doing as a family is uh, that we are able to buy milk from even our immediate neighbors. Even if it's only three liters, we have told them, just bring it, we'll buy it for you. And this makes them feel now, at least at the end of the month or at the end of two weeks, at the end of one week, I have got somewhere I can go and collect my Kenya shillings, which I can use to buy my children food, school fees, clothing, and so forth. So that has really motivated us. And of course, what has really made this farm uh, be where it is, I can't forget the community surrounding us. They take this farm as their project. What I have learned, we have learned as a, as a family and the, uh, and the daily sector, there are things which people take for granted when you see cows on a farm. And uh, among them is, uh, I have a cow, yes. Where are the feeds? I have a cow, where is the water? Okay, I have a cow, where is the market? I have a cow, where am I going to get people to take care of these cows? That, those are, are some of the things you need to think about. Let me start with the food. Because without enough feeds, let me tell you, you sleep halfway the night, halfway the night you are thinking about what this cow will eat. We have an experience from when we, took, we, bring in, we brought in our first six cows. We brought in six cows without knowing where the food is. We are bringing the cows first, where is the food? Because you are assuming the food is everywhere. Until you get the cows and then you notice a cow does not eat from a plate. It takes volumes. Then you have no food to give them. They will actually, if you are not careful, they can make you go into depression. So before you bring in a cow, please plan a year before. So that by the time that cow comes, you have enough stock for one year. Such that even if the season does not work well for you the time you bring the cow, you still know I have a stock for one year. Even if there will be drought, you still know I have food for one year. If you get, you have no money because they will not come in and give you money straight away. You still have food at least for one year. Then what you'll be doing is stopping up. So if they take one turn to you know, I have less, I'm less one turn, I need to replace the one turn. Failure to that, you're in problem. The, the other thing you also need to do, to do is to have your water flow clear to yourself because without water, you're in, in problems. A cow takes a lot of water. And the construction, that is the physical uh, comfort of the cow. The journey into the dairy farm, farming is not, has not been easy and uh, the Mever dairy farm is not an exceptional. And uh, our journey from the six cows to currently 149 uh, of cows and about 28 bulls is not, is not something that we can say we have, it has been a walkover. It is with challenges. Some of the challenges we have gone through which are obvious to every other daily farm, but I need to mention them here, is the feeds. So the feeds, we have to get ways of where we are going to get the feeds. Quality feeds, quality fodder, that means quality daily meal for the animals and even for our cows. And the other challenge we had was marketing. Marketing, we didn't complain about marketing of our milk because never daily farm markets its milk to never the company, that's the factory. And then when it's taken over by the factory, they have their ATMs 
which are six in number, and they have uh, their customers who come to collect the milk from us to go and sell somewhere else. And uh, we also make the other milk into yogurt and to fermented. We would like to increase the volumes of our fermented milk or our yogurt, which currently we do about 200 liters every day. We are looking forward to the day we'll be able to do 4,000 liters in a day. Looking at what we have been able to achieve so far, our mission as a family for Mevet Farm is to see it grow into a center of excellence in uh, milk products and uh, other than milk products a demonstration farm for farmers a training center we look forward to the day we'll be able even we have not lost the idea that or the vision that we had that training so we are looking forward to a day we are most likely going to have a daily farm center for training farmers that is a part of our vision and uh, the other thing is that we are looking forward to the day that we'll have not only milk production but haver production, a breeding farm for farmers who would like to have the best of havers in the country and in the region. That is my story as a, an agro entrepreneur in the dairy sector. I'm interested to hear what is your experience in your adventure, what's your story? I don't know about you, but Anne's story is one of resilience and passion. Now still on dairy, next week we meet David whose passion in helping dairy farmers to start and run a profitable dairy business egged him on to master the trade and later start Performita, a consultancy firm purely focusing on dairy farming. He will share his journey ahead of the upcoming series, which he will host on the A to Z of dairy farming. Look out for that series, which we will be uploading on a different YouTube channel dedicated to all things dairy. How good can it get? Before then, go ahead and subscribe to All Things Agriculture on this channel.